Hello, my friends, welcome back to another musical moment in the life of the old time rock and roller. Today, I have a very special guest. My friend Mark Levine is one of the best bass players I have ever worked with. We started in 1974 in my band Slingshot, playing at the Whiskey A Go Go, and we got our first record deal. In 1975, 76, Mark and I were roommates and we played together in the Kathy McDonald band. It was an incredible experience. Then when I went to Muscle Shoals to do the Stranger in Town album with Bob Seger, Mark recorded the bass on Johnny Rivers, slow dancing and sway into the music. That was his first gold recording. Mark also backed up Rick Springfield with Eddie Rodriguez on drums, another friend of mine. He's been in Disney movies. He backed up Barry Manilow for over a decade and Stevie Wonder. So without further ado, let me bring on my friend, Mark Levine. How's it going, Mark? Good, yeah, how are you? Good to see you, man. Yeah, it's been a long time. I think the last time we talked was about seven or eight years ago in October, and you and Ray had done a pickup gig backing up Kathy McDonald somewhere in San Francisco. Do you recall that? Was that I? I don't. I, me and Ray, the uh, keyboard player, Raymond Victor. Yeah. Um, I don't remember backing up Kathy with him. I remember doing a, just some sort of gig. I don't think Kathy was on that. How long ago did she pass away? Um, this, about, a, about a week after this particular gig, because wow. Ray, Ray called me and he said, um, hey, I'm on this, bit, on this gig and I'm backing up Kathy and I want to put you on the phone with an old friend of yours. And oh. it was you, and we talked. Okay. In fact, Ray, Ray said that yeah, he played through the whole night, and Kathy said, uh, boy, you're really good. You're really good. Who are you anyway? I've never <laughs> heard of you. And he said, uh, Kathy, we, we toured together for a year and a half. It's Ray. <laughs> but, but, you know, Ray used to have hair. And he had a big beard and had put on a lot of weight. And right. um, a funny thing, we were playing, uh, we opened for the Temptations up in Ocean City uh, back in 2001. And his ex-wife worked at a real estate office right nearby. And he said, let's go visit her. I said, okay. I said, you don't say anything. Let me do the talking. And so we, he said, there, there she is by the copy machine. I recognize her. And we walked up and I said, hey, do you know us? And she looked at us and said, hmm, now you look familiar. <laughs> and she looked at Ray and she said, but you, I've never seen before in my life. And Ray <laughs> said, honey, it's me, Ray. <laughs> that's, that's, was, that's really good. Yeah, that was pretty crazy. So uh, before you came on the line, I did yeah. an intro that okay. uh, that I'll cut together with the film. Okay. And I talked about us playing at the Whiskey together in November of 74 with Slingshot when oh we got God. our record deal. And actually, uh, Leah and Kathy and Eddie we're all on that gig with us, singing back up, and Eddie played percussion. And we actually got a deal with GRT Records, uh, Michael Thevis, uh, who turned out to be the porno king, and all of our masters were impounded by the IRS, and the deal went out the window. It, oh. then, then shortly after you and I started playing together, um, I remember gigging at Roy Buchanan's club, the bus stop, 
in um, Studio City, somewhere around there, Jim Buchanan's brother. It was Jim Buchanan's club, Roy's brother. And then with Kathy, we did a lot of touring. I mentioned us being roommates, you playing with the Undisputed Truth, backing up uh, Johnny Rivers and slow dance and sway into the music, playing with the Undisputed Truth, being in some Disney movies, backing up Barry for over a decade, Stevie Wonder. So I've set the stage for you. So why don't you come on and tell me your part of the story? I, this is your tennis day, right? Uh, tennis day today? No, no. no. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but that's basically my life right now is just playing music and tennis. Oh, that's, that's good. It. That's a that's yeah. a great sport. Yeah. So where do you want to start? Oh boy! I mean, we I could I could talk about how you know I mean it's been almost fifty years that we've been <laughs> yeah, the first fifty yeah. years, right? So uh, I can I can remember driving I can remember driving to San Francisco with you to play with Kathy mm -hmm. at, at the Keystone Clubs. Yeah, we, we all Eddie Money opened up for us. That I don't why wow, you. I can't. How do you remember this stuff? Uh, actually, it, it, it was the Keystone Corner in Berkeley. Eddie opened for us, and then we played the Lion's Share in San Anselmo, and Nick Grevenides and Mickey Hart from the Grateful Dead, uh, and Nick sang with the Electric Flag. They asked if they could do a blues with us. Wow. We said we said sure, and so we we got to play with Nick the Greek. And Mickey Hart on that particular show, but you had that big, long yellow Econoline van. I had a yellow van at that time. Yeah. Yeah. I and remember driving. Yeah, I remember being in the car. You, me, and Beverly and the dog. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there was there was another time where we were. It was Kathy and me, and I think her name was. Marlene Rubin, she was married to Carmine Apathy, the drummer for the Vanilla Fudge and um, Blue Murder and like that. Yeah. And that, that was, I think, the time we played at, at Bippy's and Kathy went missing. You remember that? I remember one time playing somewhere and she had her daughter with her. Aaron, and yeah. Somebody knocked on the uh, door. Of, I was with Beverly, and we had the dog. We three of us were in a room, and somebody knocked on the door and wanted to pass Aaron off to me because Kathy had ended up in the hospital or something like that. Well, um, we, we had done it, we had done the job, right? And we got up the next morning, and you know, Kathy would always disappear with her friends after, right? Because okay. she had a huge following from Big Brother and all that stuff. And this particular gig, it was time to check out. We went to her room. She wasn't there. We went to the lobby. We looked around. We tried calling some of her friends. We spent about three or four hours searching, calling the police, everything. And we got back to L.A. and she called us three days later. And she said something like, I OD'd on reds or two and alls and ended up in the hospital and you guys oh, left me there you abandoned me and we said yeah. we didn't even know where you were but yeah right right so i vaguely remember that stuff I, I i can't you take like memory sharpening pills or something i don't know how you do it, it about <laughs> yeah about eight years show you how bad i, I want to, show you, to show you how bad i am about memory yeah so last night I did a gig, and the drummer came with his girlfriend, and she said, I, the girlfriend said, yeah, I'm a singer. I said, oh, nice to meet you and all this stuff. And she was just kind of looking at me, and uh, she goes, did you, she mentioned a band that I had played with when I moved up to the Bay Area, and she yeah. goes, do you remember going to Bermuda and playing a, cor a corporate party with that band? I said, yeah. She goes, well, I was one of the sub-vocalists on that gig. And it wasn't that long ago. <laughs> I, said, I had no idea who she was. 
So no. You were on that gig with Bermuda? She's like, yeah. I said, oh, okay. I said, do you remember me? She goes, yeah, I remember you. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Uh, yeah. Uh, about uh, about seven years ago, when I still had more memory, um, a girl, one of my fans, got in touch with me and asked if she could write a book on me. And I said, oh yeah, sure, why not? I've been thinking about it. but And so she kept sending me these questions. And after three or four emails, I said, you know what? I can do this better myself. And so I went back to when I was born. And I looked at one of these fact and figure things like popular movies, popular songs, you know, what was happening and all this stuff. And I laid out every year and then I tried to fill in the blanks. And um, and I that that sent me on a deep search. And thank God for the Internet. I was able to find all these people that I had played with and so on and so forth. But. I refer to my notes, but I I remembered you. I didn't have to. <laughs> I didn't have to look at my notes. All right, let's say, let's Mark let's Levine, let's who let's is this guy? So, uh, give, you know, give me a young Mark. <laughs> young Mark. So, so why don't you? Tell, right, so, uh, I'll start. You, me... you just go ahead. Tell us about Johnny River. Tell us about Rick Springfield. Everything. Disney. Everything that you remember, of course. All right, so, all right, all right, I'll see, okay. All right, so first of all, first of all, this is this is fantastic because we've known each other for just shy of 50 years, right. which is amazing. We're survivors in this business, you know? We're still above ground and we're still making music, and that's a success story in itself, you know? It really so, is. It, it is, it is. And the music business is so funny because you never know how you're going to get a gig. You never yeah. know what's going to pop up. You never know who you're going to run into and what's going to be available. The uh, the great story for me is I played with Barry Manilow for, for 10 years or so, so. And the great story for me is how I got that gig. Because I was playing in L.A. I was doing jazz gigs sometimes, jazz fusion gigs. And one of the guys who would be on the gig when he was in town, was uh, the keyboard player, one of the keyboard players for Barry Manilow, who was also his music director. And one day he called me up and he said, hey, listen, Barry Manilow just did a music video. And in the video, he had an all-girl band. You know, so now he's got this brilliant idea. He wants to put together a band of all women. But what we need to do is we're going to have a ton of women auditioning. What we need to do is we need to have like a house band to back up the women who are, are auditioning. And so, for instance, if a guitar player comes, a woman guitar player comes into audition, the guitar player in the house band will sit out and will back up the guitar player. If a woman bass player comes in to audition, you sit out and will back up the bass player. But I don't know how long this gig is going to last for you. But, you know, it's going to be at least four or five days. And it's a good day rate for pay. And so would you be interested in doing something like that? And I said, sure. So they had put uh, advertisements in all these Hollywood kind of publications like Variety, Hollywood Reporter. So you can just imagine what was coming out of the woodwork. All these actresses, you know, who are used to people saying to them, hey, you know, uh, we want you to advertise our product. Can you ride a horse backwards while, you know, juggling a, an apple on your head? And they would say, sure, sure, you know. So they would come into this, this audition. Can you play guitar? Yeah, I, I know a few chords. You know, I can learn whatever you want me to learn, you know. And it would be, just be horrible. It would just be horrible. You know, so we went through about a week of this, and he did find a saxophone player and a percussion player. Stay a little a, closer to the mic, please. Huh? Okay, so he did find he did find a, a saxophone player and a percussion player out of this conglomeration of Hollywood women that came in. But at the end of the week, he came over to me. He said, and he was just like he just had this look on his face, like. 
this is horrible. And he said, uh, are you available to go on the road? You know? So that was kind of a weird way of getting a gig, I think. You know? Yeah, yeah. So that was that was pretty cool. Yeah. And that then was- uh, during the course, and he it was really great because during the course of playing with him, maybe about about six months into the gig, he took four or five months off. So myself and the guitar player, the drummer, and a different keyboard player, not the musical director, we would get together at the guitar player's house and just play jazz. Mm -hmm. And then we started bringing in some songs Mm -hmm. that we had written. And then we started playing gigs out in L.A. and doing gigs. And then we got offered a record deal uh, because we were starting to draw people. And And Barry came to see us. And he said, hey, how would you guys like to be the opening act on the tour? We're like, yeah. So from that moment on, we were the opening act. We would go out on tour. We, we would go out on stage and we would play until they told us to stop, until Barry was ready to play. Then we'd play our 30 minutes, 45 minutes, whatever it would be. And then we'd run off stage. We'd have like five minutes to change clothes. And then we'd go running back out with the rest of the band to do his show. So it was a great experience. It was a wonderful experience. So cool. that was a lot of fun. What, yeah. what are some of the uh, highlight gigs you remember? Uh, well, I do remember playing the Spectrum in uh, Philadelphia. Mm-hmm. It was a huge, huge, huge arena. I think it held about 18,000. But yep. that was the first time my, my mom and dad came to a show. They drove over from New York. Awesome. So, and that, that was and then I remember playing, I grew up on Long Island. So right. I remember playing Nassau Coliseum, which was the place I used to go to see all concerts when I was a kid. Mm-hmm. So that was pretty cool, having you know seen so many bands play in Nassau Coliseum, and now I was playing there. Absolutely. It was, it was really a kick. So it was great. And then we did some great stuff. You know, we were the first time, I was only in the band for about two months, and we already uh, had a Japan tour. Uh, scheduled, so I went to Japan for the first time, and all over Europe, and a lot of international travel. That was really great. Super. So all that stuff. Good. And the one thing that people always say, you know, you go on the road with a major act, and uh, you're just go- traveling from city to city. You don't get to see anything. But the opposite was true with Barry, because when I first started with him, he would always be playing multiple dates in the same city. The first time I went to Tokyo with him. He, we played seven nights, oh. and just the first day had to be at the venue for sound check. The rest of the week, they'd say, just make sure you're here by 7 o'clock. So I was doing a lot of sightseeing. I actually was jumping on bullet trains and going to other cities oh, and making man. sure I was back in Tokyo by about 6. Yeah, so it was fantastic. I got to see so much. Mm-hmm. However... The tenth time you go through Des Moines, Iowa, nothing against people who live in Iowa, but you know, after a while, some of the places get to be a little boring. Yeah, but yeah, but it was a it was a fantastic experience. It was great. It was great. Now, did you spend time in Vegas doing a stint with Barry? Well, when I was playing with him, we would do. Uh, he wasn't doing like the residency that came later after I was gone. So, but we did play, we would go to Vegas and we would play uh, maybe three weeks. And then we go to Tahoe, we play another three weeks. Then we go to Atlantic City. So we get all the casino towns done, you know, yeah. in a couple of months. And so that was kind of, that was a little bit hard because the more you're in a, a town like that, the later and later you start going to bed. And yeah. then you feel like a vampire because you never see the sun. Right? Yeah. Yeah. But it was, you know, that, and, but it was, those shows were easier because the casinos, their main thing is to get these people in and out of the show and back, back into the gambling rooms. Right. So, so rather than doing, you know, when, when I played, uh, the normal show with Mallow was, would be, you know, by the time he would go on, it would be like a two, a two and a half hour show sometimes. And, uh, you know, it would be. It would be a long show, but when you played the casinos, it was 90 minutes. It was it. Yeah. 90 minutes. So it was easier. And then he started off two shows a night, but then it got cut down to one. 
the same thing we I did uh, two months on Broadway with him, and it started off. It was going to be seven shows a week at this Broadway theater. And it got cut down to five. And the same thing happened. We played in London at a theater for two months. And the same thing there. We played five shows a week for two months. So when you were in those... So that was a lot of time to be living in London. Wow, that's great, man. What years were those? Uh, I want to say probably the late uh, 1980s. Mm. And there's a Barry Manilow album out. There's a double CD out called uh, Live on Broadway. Which I put, which I'm on that. Oh, that's uh, great! It's pretty. Cool. There was a uh, Showtime special that was in conjunction with the CD and all that, so it was pretty cool. Pretty right, cool. that's neat. It's interesting because you know I play. With... What's that? I w I was just going to say when when you were in Vegas and your show got cut from two and a half hours to ninety minutes, did your pay get cut too, or was was it still the same? Oh. Oh, still the same. That's we good. Had a, we had a negotiated road pay and a negotiated uh, uh, rehearsal pay when we were at home. Mm -hmm. So there's different pay scales. And whenever he wanted us to do, whenever we were on the road and he wanted, they wanted us to do some extra things, like if we were being filmed, I remember being filmed for a BBC special in, in England. Uh -huh. And sometimes he wanted us to get together and do like demo recordings for him. And uh, anything, TV shows, like we did the Tonight Show, our Arsenio Hall show, all those things was extra pay. Uh, yeah. So that was above and beyond your, your road pay. Well, sure. it was cool for me because I had done some TV work. So I was in the AFTRA union, uh, yeah. which has a, has a higher pay scale than the musicians union. So mm -hmm. when I would do the TV shows like the Tonight Show, I would always run my contract through after and make more money than the guy standing next to me who was running his contract through the musicians union. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's pretty smart. Well, you always were a smart guy, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> little little perks, things like that. You know, yeah. it was really funny because I, you know, you, uh, you mentioned the Undisputed Truth, yeah. which was that uh, it was a black singing group and they had the hit records, Smiling Faces. Right. And so, yeah, so we were doing, when I was with them, we were playing arenas and we were opening up for bands like KC and the Sunshine Band, the Ohio Players. So the very last gig I ever did with the Undisputed Truth was in Salt Lake City at the Salt Palace, which was the basketball arena there. Mm -hmm. And the very first gig I did for Barry Manilow was at the Salt Palace. No kidding. So, yeah. That's pretty serendipitous. That's, yeah, that's it pretty, was pretty fun. So, what, what, how long did you work with Rick Springfield? No, I never did. I when I was with the other Studio Truth, uh, I did audition for Rick Springfield because my friends were playing in the band. Eddie Rodriguez, so he right. mentioned he was in the band, and Gabriel Katona. Okay, uh, yeah. He, yeah. So th these guys were friends of mine. They were in Rick's band. And they needed a bass player, and they asked me to go play to be in the band. I went and I. I, uh, you know, did one day of rehearsal with them and playing with them. This was way before Jesse's Girl was a hit record. Right, right. So at the time, I was doing really good gigs with the Under Street of Truth, and they wanted me to join Rick Springfield's band, and I passed on it. Mm. One, of my more, one of my more brilliant uh, musical decisions. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I passed. I said, oh, you know what? I'm just going to stick with the situation I have. Yeah. So Yeah. The devil, you know, sort of like know. bird in the hand type of right. situation. I know, yeah. I know. But you know, you mentioned something earlier uh, when we were in L.A. and and just coming up, you would play with a, in as many bands as you could. I mean, would I know I was in two or three bands at one time because you never know which one's going to take off or which one you're in that will lead you to your next gig that's even better. So uh, what, well, yeah, go ahead. I, was, I have a friend who I've known since second grade, and he's a guitar player. His name is Steve Carnelli. And I know he, Steve. Yeah, when he moved out to L.A., he moved out to live in L.A. permanently before I did. Mm -hmm. And he became a studio musician 
the great Tommy Tedesco became his mentor uh-huh. and got him into all TV and movie soundtrack work. And he he ended up in a Hanna Barbera house band playing on all the Hanna Barbera cartoons like wow. the Jets and the Flintstones and all that stuff. And when I moved out to LA, the first thing he said to me was, "Do everything you can." Yep. If I can say one thing to you, just do everything you can. Yeah. So I took good that advice. to heart. Yeah, good advice. And we did. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> now, we so, had a wild story when we were living together. Okay. On, wondering- King, on, King, on King's Road, right, right down from, right in between the Starwood and the Whiskey and Bill Gazzari's. And... I don't know what night of the week it was, but I had been up to the Rainbow Room. Wasn't it Halloween? Halloween? Was it, was it a Halloween night? No? It, it, I'm not sure. I know that my car had been broken into and my keys were stolen. And I had a very bad feeling about that. And... <laughs> And I had I had read in a Playboy magazine, and I was looking at it, and the guy was testing all these exotic beers, and it showed him having a Heineken and the his face after, and then a Dos Equis, and you know he got to about a half a dozen beers, and he was kind of three sheets to the wind. So it was a boring night, and I thought, well, maybe I'll try that. I had gone to bed. You had gone to bed. And I hear a disturbance, like a, and I said, oh, this is odd. And I, I kept the pistol by my bed because you never know what's going on. And so I, I was yeah. naked. I walked out into the living room and there were two um, African-American gentlemen like <laughs> playing around. And I said, you, out the door now. And they, <laughs> they saw me and they said, uh-oh. And they <laughs> ran out the door. And so I went back to my bedroom, and then from your room, I hear, we're going to have a shootout. This guy in here. And I, I don't, you must have been on the floor, or, I don't know, sweating bullets or something. But the next thing I know, the door opens, and I'm, I'm expecting this guy jumping out to be firing. So he jumped out, but he had a, a gigantic candle, and he threw it at me. And, and I took a couple of shots. and. When the police came and they said, did you get him? Did you get him? I said, no, I missed. And they were like, oh. <laughs> But what was going right. through your mind? Well, that, what was going through that, your that, mind I, in your room? But that happened. So the first thing that happened was the door to my room opened. And I thought it was Robbie Roberti because it was this real tall guy. Yeah. And I, I woke up and go, Robbie? The guy jumped on me. Now, I had really long hair, and I was laying in bed. I think he thought I was a woman. And so I started wrestling with him, and I threw him off. I got him off me, and I ran out my door into your room. And that's when you were, you came, you were me and you and your ex-girlfriend, Terry. Terry. We were all in your room, and this guy was in my room. And you said, you yelled at him, come on out, I have a gun. And he said, so do I. We're going to have a shootout. And then he threw the can. He came. The door opens. He threw the candle at us, and he he beelined for the front door. Mm. And uh, you took a shot at him. I remember that the bullet yeah. went on the wall. It yeah. was astounding that we there we are in an apartment building with all these apartments up on the third. We're on the third floor. All these apartments kind of surrounding a pool area. Not one person ever came out of their apartment to check out what was going on. <laughs> and when the police showed up, they wanted coffee. <laughs> hey, you got any coffee on? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I just happened to have a fresh pot. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. And you know what? For me, that happened, I think it was it was right around 3 a.m. Yeah. And for a solid year, no matter what time I went to bed, at 3 a.m., my eyes would pop open. Really? It, it was almost like, in a way, it was almost like Groundhog Day. Because... Yeah. <laughs> I go to sleep. I be in a deep sleep, and all of a sudden, boom! My eyes open. I, after about a month, I say it's got to be about three a.m. And I look at the clock. Yep, three a.m. So, so that happened for about a year. That uh, that's trauma, you know. Yeah. So that and that that 
that finally wore off, but that stayed with me for a little while. Yeah, that was traumatic. That's... Exciting. Yeah, exciting. What Hollywood excitement. Hollywood <laughs> excitement, right? Uh, so, so uh, that's just... yeah. It, it, we had we had some good times. I I remember when Robbie had when we had just come back from the tour of Asia, and Rob rented that house, and he had all those little cottages in the back that he was like sort of sub renting. You and Beverly had rented one, and I remember you saying right. Sunday night is new music night. We always you know turn it on and you know groove out. <laughs> That's uh, funny. So, um, who are some of the other celebrities that you uh, worked with in the Barry time, was there something about Stevie Wonder? And Yeah. Well, what happened was, so we had this, like, you know, I was saying we had this little group within a group, our own little jazz band. Right. And uh, what happened was Barry would get all these uh, gigs where he would be doing AIDS benefits or charity events and things like that. And uh, he would be one of many artists that would be doing these shows. And he f somehow was able to get our smaller band, the gig, to be the house band and back up all these different artists at these different shows. So, plus we would be augmented by other musicians, some from Barry's band, some from uh, other places. And mm -hmm. so I remember uh, we would be doing, uh, uh, I remember one time going, going to Radio City Music Hall in New York and being on uh, some show where we were backing up Barry and we backed up uh, Melissa Manchester, Manhattan Transfer. And then uh, I remember in L.A. one time there was a show, there was a tribute to Bette Midler oh. that was thrown by the uh, American Film Institute. It was a private event. Mm -hmm. And so he got us the house band for that. And so we had to back up Barry and we backed up uh, uh, a whole bunch of different people on that one too. I, I, you know, a lot of names. But the one about that one was Stevie, all these people would be coming up to give speeches and, they, and Stevie Wonder wasn't scheduled to perform. But he came up and he gave his speech. The master of ceremonies on this one was Dudley Moore. Remember Dudley Moore? I do. Okay, well, Dudley Moore was a piano player. Hmm. Classically trained, but he was yes, a piano Yes, yes. Right. So we were the house band. Stevie went, we, we play Stevie Wonder's music for him to come up. He gives a speech talking about how wonderful Bette Midler is, you know. And then his handler comes up to take him off stage. And we're playing music to play him off. And he stops and he turns around and takes off his sunglasses and looks at the band. And like one eye is going. What, what were you playing when he was walking out? Uh, I can't remember. Superstition or something, right? Yeah, some, some Stevie Wonder song. Yeah. I don't remember the song. But, you know, he stops and he turns and looks at us. And he, he says something to his handler. So we stopped playing when he did that. He, he, uh, clearly wanted us to stop yeah. so he, he said something to his handler and he walked back he, he was walked back to the podium and he said i'll play a song if dudley will play piano so dudley's like okay so they go next to the piano and we started playing the song i just called to say i love you oh, no. and so we're playing it and stevie's singing it and dudley's playing piano but you know dudley is a classically trained piano player right so he's got no groove or anything he's just playing all this really flowery flourishing you know all this stuff all over the piano by the end of the first verse stevie had sat down on the piano bench by the middle of the chorus he had pushed dudley over and he was playing with one hand and by the end of the song he had knocked him completely off the piano bench <laughs> <laughs> That's so a I got great story. Went through that time, and that was also uh, that was a big surprise for Bet because they had flown in from all over the country anybody who had ever been one of her background singers. Uh -huh. And Barry told us, he goes, "I'm going to come up on stage. We're going to start the song Boogie Woogie Bugle Boy, and one and like in twos and threes, these background singers are all going to come out 
from behind the stage and we have we'll have microphones set up for them and he said she won't be able to contain herself by the, the time all the singers get out there she's going to be on stage and she's going to want to sing and that's exactly what happened she came running up on stage and we did boogie boogie, boogie bugle boy with her oh that's it was kind of a fun, kind of a fun yeah it was a great moment so i had a lot of situations like that where i was backing up all these different people. I got to play with Rosemary Clooney, uh, Burt Bacharach, and Carol Bayer Sager were a couple at the time. We got to play with them. Dionne Warwick, Diane Schur, who was a blind piano player, jazz artist. Uh, I'm trying to remember who else. Donna uh, Summer, ever? No, I didn't play with Donna Summer, but what a great story was that. When I was playing in Tahoe, she was playing at the casino next door. And some of her uh, band members came to see our show and they just kind of wa wandered backstage and we were talking to them and they said, you want to come see us tomorrow night? You you're off tomorrow night. You want to come see us? And we said, yeah. So we got there. And uh, at that time when we were at a casino show, you had to, it was like a two drink minimum. You mm -hmm. order your drink and two of them come out yeah. before the show. So we're sitting there at the table with everybody's got their, their two drinks in front of them. And at the end of the show, uh, we tried to pay the bill, and they said, no, the, the bill's been picked up by Donna Summer, by Miss Miss Summer, you know. I mm -hmm. say, like, okay. So we go backstage to thank her, and we were there for, like, hours. And she's showing us this homemade jewelry that she makes. And, I mean, we weren't talking about music at all. Yeah, We were just talking about all kinds of different stuff. And the, the jewelry was great. You know, I was waiting for her to give us some, but she didn't. And uh, and, and she was really, I mean, she was like so nice and down to earth. It was great. So Barry, Barry was at the show with us at a different table, uh -huh. but he didn't come backstage with us. I think they kind of knew each other. He, you know, he didn't, he didn't come backstage. So, so that was a great experience. Yeah. And also... You're you're living you live where in South Carolina? Uh South Virginia. Carolina? You're in Virginia, okay. So uh the at the very beginning of this conversation I was talking about the musical director for Barry Mantle's band. Right. That they hired me. He was first cousins with Bruce Springsteen. Oh no kidding. They're, they're, yeah, their moms were sisters. Wow. So one time we had an off night, we were in the we were in the Southeast, and I can't remember what state we were in, but we were in the Southeast, and I'm looking in the newspaper in the morning, and I see that Bruce Springsteen is playing the venue that we're going to be playing the next day. Bruce Springsteen is playing there that night. So I call Victor, the musical director, and I said, hey, Vic, your cousin's playing tonight here in this city. He goes, where? I told him. He goes, he goes all right, I'll call you back. So he called his mom, who called her sister, who called her son, and said, Hey Bruce, Vic is in town with his with the Barry Manilow band. He wants ten tickets to the show tonight. It's like, okay. <laughs> and then the relay went back the other way. Yeah. And we all went to the concert and we all went backstage. So I got to hang out in the green room with all the guys in the band, talk to the guys in the band. Bruce never came out of his dressing room. Yeah, Victor, he went into Bruce's dressing room and talked to them there. Mm -hmm. But Bruce was, for whatever reason, he didn't want to come out right. and join the crowd. Yeah. So, uh, but it was really fun. That's cool. That's really cool. Well, we're getting close to the end of our time. Yeah. Yeah. Why don't you let the people know how they can get in touch with you, what websites, your profiles, your social media, and like that, so they can follow your career in depth because I'm sure you're going to get a lot more fans after this airs. <laughs> well, first of all, thank you for doing this. It's great. It's great to see your face again. Thank and you. congratulations to you on the success of all your records and stuff. That's really great. I'm glad to see you're still, you know, still out there, still doing it. And uh, so as far as I'm concerned, really, if you go to my Facebook page, um, I actually do have my resume listed there. I have my email address. I don't have a website, but mm -hmm. I do have, I do post on there everything that's going on. 
M A R C L E V I N E on Facebook, right? Yeah, M A R C L E V I N E. Uh, you know, and I have everything that's going on is is posted there, and I have uh, ways. There's ways of getting in contact with me right there on that uh, on that Facebook page. There's an right. email address. There's a phone number you can text. There's all that stuff. Super, super. Well, I wish we had more time, but I'm really thankful for you taking the time today. And it's great to see you and that you're still in the music business. And Rob Roberti, he lives down in North Carolina, the state under me. And he's retired now, but he told me to say hi. Yeah, well, give him my regards. You know, it, I have so many great memories of those days. It's just fantastic. <laughs> I said we were kids in the prime of our lives. Yeah, there you go. And, exactly. and now we're we're big kids in the, the twilight of our lives. But, but, we're, <laughs> but we're still kids. But we're, we're still, still kids. kids. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Doing what we like. Exactly. All right, Mark. Well, I'll send you, uh, once I get this together, I'll, I'll post the link on Facebook and you'll have it. Okay, perfect. All right. Fantastic. I, I got to go play acoustic at a party right now. So, all right. Have a great. So long, my friends. <laughs>